Hello and welcome to Psyched, the show where we explore psychedelics through social, economic, and political perspectives. is Kevin Matthews. Kevin Matthews is the co-founder and executive director for the Nonprofit Society for Psychedelic Outreach, Reform, and Education, also known as SPOR. He worked with the Denver Psilocybin Initiative to become the first city to decriminalize psilocybin and continues to support psychedelic outreach, education, and reform. Kevin, thank you so much for joining us and welcome to Psyched. Hey, good morning and good afternoon and good evening to everyone who's watching wherever in the world you are. Um, I feel uh, tremendously honored to be here today and to be able to share a little bit about the work that we're doing here in Denver and also across the United States with the Society for Psychedelic Outreach Reform and Education. And uh, before I get started, um, for those of you who are watching or listening, I'd like to invite you to take a few moments to share um, a few deep breaths with me in uh, what is probably the most simple breathwork practice in existence, aside from just simply breathing deeply. And uh, so for those of you who are watching, what the practice is is simply six deep belly breaths in through the mouth and out through the nose. And I'll keep track. So I'll go ahead and invite anyone who's watching or listening to go ahead and um, find a comfortable position, comfortable seated position, and gently close your eyes and uh, join me for just a few moments in a breathwork practice. We'll start with a deep inhale through the nose. And out through the mouth. Do that five more times. One more deep inhale. And let it go. <laughs> so that feels better for me on my end. And uh, thank you for participating if you did. And uh, again, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to speak. And today, what I'd like to share with everyone is very briefly, kind of where we are now from what uh, from what I'm seeing from what from from with the people that I'm working with right now in the psychedelic ecosystem and field where we are now and where we're going and then especially because this movement has emerged and evolved so rapidly since uh, decriminalized Denver and the Denver psilocybin initiative passed last year I'd like to share a little bit more about Kind of what I've learned throughout the year and a half or two years on this journey and offer a little bit of insight and lessons learned for anyone who wants to get involved with the psychedelic movements. Um, because right now, given the current state of the world, I firmly believe that psychedelics like psilocybin can have a tremendous impact um, in our neighborhoods, in our communities, not only in our personal lives and can contribute to creating a world that really works for everyone where folks have the resources and the access to freely explore their body and explore their mind with these substances um, and additionally help create more of a strong um, interdependent uh, community. So 
to start to give everyone kind of a big overview of what exactly happened in Denver last year. So I was the campaign director of the Denver Psilocybin Initiative, and I was really one person out of um, dozens of folks who wore a lot of hats to really make the campaign possible and successful. And so on May 7th, 2019, Denver voters decided to decriminalize the personal possession use and cultivation of psilocybin mushrooms in the city and county of Denver. And they did that by making, uh, the, by making psilocybin mushrooms not only the lowest law enforcement priority, but we also restricted the city and county of Denver from using any funds, any city funds to prosecute individuals for psilocybin. And so at the time we felt like that was the absolute closest thing we could get to, to a true decriminalization of psilocybin mushrooms in Denver, uh, considering that it's still a, uh, a schedule one statewide and of course a schedule one substance federally. Um, in addition to decriminalizing psilocybin, Denver voters also created what's called the Denver Psilocybin Mushroom Policy Review Panel, which is a first of its kind municipal body in the entire world that has a mandate to uh, collect data and also really just measure the impact of decriminalizing psilocybin in the city and county of Denver and focusing on you know, what are the health impacts, the social impacts, and the possible fiscal impacts? I'm just gonna grab some water really quick. And so with that panel, the first order of business there was to establish reporting criteria for law enforcement. And so what does it mean if, if law enforcement does actually make an arrest in the city and county of Denver for psilocybin, what's all the data that they're collecting? And in addition to deciding um, on collecting data on obvious things like race and uh, gender, um, the panel also decided that it's really important to also gather information on <clears throat> not only what uh, substance is, um, what, what the substance was that someone was arrested for, in this case, if it's psilocybin, if it involves other substances, what's the, the mindset or the mental state of that individual, and, and what was the environment that they were in? So that we can really start to paint a picture, uh, two things, start to paint a picture of what potential psilocybin use in Denver looks like, and really also to ensure that law enforcement's really respecting the will of the voters here. And again, to remind folks in Denver, anyone, anyone can uh, possess, use, and cultivate psilocybin mushrooms for personal use without remuneration or without, no one can distribute psilocybin mushrooms in Denver for remuneration. And remuneration is a legal term just for sale, for profit. So, um, a big part of that reporting standards was to make sure that uh, law enforcement is following and respecting the will of the voters and really not arresting folks. And so in the last year, since the initiative has passed, we've had um, four arrests in Denver and all of those were, were for circumstances that weren't really covered by initiative 301. For example, two arrests were for folks who were under the age of 21 in Denver and um, so they were minors and they were in possession of mushrooms. And again, a lot of these arrests also include other substances which um, really needs to be considered and acknowledged when we talk about overall psilocybin arrests um, here in Denver, in Colorado and really nationwide. And consistently the data shows that, well, I think perhaps maybe all of us know who are watching that the arrest rates for psilocybin are very low. Um, and so we decided to go ahead and decriminalize in Denver because we felt that uh, no one, absolutely no one deserves to be criminalized, to be penalized, to go to jail and potentially 
um, face the loss of their livelihood or their family or their job for using and possessing a naturally occurring substance. And with that campaign and what the city is really interested in and what we discovered is that in so many ways the decriminalization of psilocybin mushrooms making sure that folks are allowed to have access to these or cultivate them and possess them in so many ways is a mental health issue and the one of the most promising things that that i discovered shortly after the campaign passed in our meetings with the city as we were talking about implementation of the initiative and kind of gearing up to have this first meeting with the review panel is that the the city seemed so much more interested in how psilocybin mushrooms could have a potential positive impact on the uh, um, mental health and wellness of denver residents um, so specifically looking at you know denver's rates of depression and Denver's rates of substance abuse and addiction. And I was just tremendously surprised to hear that city officials weren't really worried about mushrooms. Um, that is, unless the data started to change, unless we started seeing more crime or, or more arrests related to psilocybin. And to hear that they were so much more interested in how uh, mushrooms could potentially have a positive impact on mental health was very promising. And uh, for example, in a meeting with uh, the director of safety here in Denver, who oversees fire, police, and EMS, you know, he said, you know, half of our inmates in Denver have mental health or uh, behavioral health issues, and we'd really, really like to, to change that, which was so promising. Um, and so kind of what the landscape looks like right now in Denver is that you know, uh, on the city side, there's a lot of data collection going on. With that review panel, uh, we do have to make a report to Denver City Council uh, at the first city council meeting next year in 2021, a comprehensive report that shares a lot of this data that we're collecting. And, and um, right now, looks like some of that data is going to be leaning towards not only what, um, you know, personal anecdotal use looks like in Denver, but also uh, more of the mental health and uh, potential um, um, health impacts of psilocybin here. And the other thing I'd like to share is that the Society for Psychedelic Outreach Reform and Education, um, in uh, collaboration with a few other folks here in Denver, uh, worked with the polling group to conduct a statewide poll to just kind of discover what the current uh, Colorado landscape looks like to see how interested Colorado residents are in potentially pursuing some kind of a statewide um, psilocybin measure or psilocybin policy reform. And we recently received the results of that poll. Um, if you want more details on the poll, you can check out um, Kyle Yeager's um, piece that talked about the poll in Marijuana Moment. And I believe it was published yesterday. And in that poll, we discovered that fully 50% of um, Colorado voters who were contacted, and there were 500 voters who were contacted, 50% of Colorado voters would support not only the decriminalization of psilocybin in the state of Colorado, but also creating some kind of a regulated medical access model that also very specifically protects the rights and licensing, not only the rights and licensing of medical practitioners and their patients. And the fact that we went from in 2019 um, being successful in Denver by a very, very, very slim margin, it was 50.65% of Denver voters at the end of the day, that we can now have some data that shows that statewide half of Colorado voters may support some kind of a um, regulated um, medical access model, including decriminalization for the state of Colorado. And so, you know, if we're 
when you consider a statewide poll, you really need about 55 to 58 percent um, um, support in that poll to feel confident in pursuing a ballot initiative. And so that number is very promising. And it also goes to sh goes to show uh, just how much work that we still have to do here um, locally here in Denver, statewide in Colorado, and um, I think also nationally. So in order to really hit that um, additional five to eight percent of, of voters and their potential support, it's really important that we are uh, focusing on education and safety um, and responsible use and really reaching out to our communities, working with civic, social, and community leaders to really just share the good news about psilocybin, to be very clear about the, um, not, not only the benefits, but um, also the risks, because it's important for folks to know about the risks so that they're using psilocybin responsibly. And although there are risks involved, um, many of those risks can be highly minimized by uh, proper education. And so a lot of the work that the Society for Psychedelic Outreach, Reform and Education, again, in collaboration with um, other amazing nonprofits um, locally in Denver, um, also in the state of Colorado and nationally, you know, we're very, very, very focused on, on, on education, on uh, community building, we call it mycelial organizing, um, and also working with others to really develop and foster leadership in this space. And so with that, and you know, considering the, the, just the, 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 how quickly this movement has gone um, just in the course of the last year or so, um, you know, we got to hear from Tom and Cherie just recently, and it was such a pleasure to see them there for a few minutes when I logged in. You know, we have the state of Oregon right now that's looking at a, a statewide measure. Uh, Washington, D.C. Um, is currently collecting signatures for a city ballot. Um, we recently had an assemblywoman in the state of New York introduce uh, some kind of, of psilocybin uh, descheduling in, in New York. And so and then we also have, you know, all of the incredible news from uh, the, the clinical side coming out and sharing about the tremendous benefits and, and potential for psilocybin mushrooms. And so this truly is, um, from my opinion, it's, it's not just a national movement. It's not just a, a global movement. This, this um, psychedelic renaissance or psychedelic movement or perhaps psychedelic revolution, to me, this is really a human movement. Um, and, and with that, and just with how quickly it's moving, so many more people are, are being encouraged to, to get involved as advocates, as activists, um, as leaders in this space. Um, and being relatively new to this space myself, and just kind of you know, seeing the process that people have gone through with, them, with, with our work here in Denver, and then you know, seeing the, the vast amount of, of interest that folks have in, in doing this work, uh, it's so important that more people show up um, in collaboration, and, and I think especially feeling confident that folks can actually really share about how much psilocybin or other psychedelics have dramatically transformed their lives. And so I want to leave plenty of time for questions. And so I want to take just a few more minutes just to talk a little bit about those lessons that um, I've learned in this process um, for folks who do want to get involved and, and, and emerge as leaders wherever you are in the world for this movement. And the first thing to consider there is, is commitment. Um, how committed are you to this work? And I would argue that, um, well, I'll frame it this way. When I'm working with folks, one of the first questions that I ask is, tell me about your experience with psilocybin mushrooms and how it has impacted your life. And you can tell very quickly when somebody doesn't have a lot of experience because um, they don't necessarily have a very quick answer to that question. And so um, 
talking about this level of, of commitment, it's kind of like when you, when you, you know, finish your five gram uh, uh, tea, you're committed, you know, you're going all in and there's no looking back. And so that's part of this process is be committed. Um, the next part is really start exploring, start seeing what the community needs, start seeing how you can, you can, who you can work with, how you can make an impact, how you can form a team or a tribe or a council or a group of people to explore what's possible in your community, whether you're working with attorneys or lawyers or other activists, start getting involved, start sharing your voice, start exploring what's possible. And then as you start exploring, you're gonna meet a ton of people and you're gonna be communicating with these people. And so very clear lines of communication and very strong, clear intentions are also needed um, and highly encouraged for anybody who wants to get involved in this space. And then with communication uh, comes cooperation, right? This is a mycelial movement. It's decentralized. It's the kind of thing where um, a rising tide raises all ships. And if we can work together in cooperation and in unison to accomplish this work, then it will happen. Um, I think um, I'm just welling up sharing about it right now because that was such, Denver was such an example of that, of what happens when a dedicated, passionate group of individuals come together to do something new and amazing. Um, most of us who worked on that campaign had never campaigned before. Um, it was my first time as an advocate or an activist by any real stretch of the means, and certainly my first time as a campaign director. And I can't tell you how incredibly Oh man, just how awesome it is to, to work with so many amazing, wonderful, passionate people with this movement. And that's those four things that I mentioned, commitment, exploration, communication, cooperation. Those are, um, in my opinion, um, a big part of, of the uh, external process for, for how we move in the world. It's, it's how we're, we're reaching out and, and kind of showing up outside to share this work. And then on the inside, there's also inner work, and and I can share you from share with you from personal experience that that this work is um, uh, tremendously transformative, and and a lot of the times, you know, what's required with growth and transformation is is um, is a breaking down and a removing of obstacles and barriers in order to um, you know fully emerge and blossom um, into a more whole. Um, integrated person. And so um, in that internal work, and this is related to commitments, in order to have commitment, we need to have discipline. We do need a structure. We do need standard operating procedures. We need a, a, a practice or a ritual um, to, to really get grounded and honed in and focused on, uh, on the intent and the commitment of this work. So being disciplined about it. Uh, the next part is discovery. And discovery is related to exploration, right? We can explore and uh, be traveling through the wilderness like, uh, like I did with my family last weekend in the middle of nowhere. Um, and it's great to explore, but when we discover something new um, is what can be so powerful and so illuminating. And for example, I went on this hike, um, this backpacking trip with my family last weekend and with my little five-year-old son and and my wife and uh, we hiked up to the top of this mountain. And at the top of the mountain, you were exploring this wild landscape, which was, it was beautiful and amazing, but we had a destination. And when we got there, uh, we found a 30 year old time capsule um, inside the, 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 the felled trunk of a tree. And it was this little glass jar with a rusty cap on it, five pennies and a little note that just said, hey, happy you're here, what a beautiful spot. Um, and so the discovery is so important. And so you can't discover anything until you explore. Um, and then with communication, what's related internally here is, is, um, is integration. You know, how are we not only learning from um, our exploration and our discovery and our commitment and our communication, um, but how are we not only learning from it, but applying those lessons learned, really integrating what we've learned so that we can show up 
more whole, more integrated, more passionate, more fired up for this work. And then the last piece is, and I know that we got to get to questions here. And so the last piece really is, is liberation. Um, and, you know, this is a process that has worked for me. And, and a, a big glaring example about liberation is that when we can put all these pieces together, commitment, exploration, communication, cooperation, discipline, discovery, integration, we can come to a place of liberation. And for example, liberating psilocybin mushrooms in Denver, Colorado. Um, and so I hope that, that, and it was very brief, I hope that, that information um, was valuable and um, we'll just go from there. I'm more than happy to answer any questions for, for our audience and thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Kevin. Really appreciate uh, everything, all of your insights and, and everything you're bringing and all the work you've done. Um, would love to start out with uh, one of our audience questions. Uh, it's kind of in two parts. Uh, first off is, you know, is there clear documents or resources available for, for how people to get involved? Um, if you have some links you could share, that would probably be pretty useful to this individual. Um, also, you know, is, the, uh, is decriminalization specifically limited to Denver's uh, city limits? Uh, does it go anywhere beyond that? Is there um, a strategy to go and kind of extend, extend that boundary? Um, what does that look like too? Yeah, thank you. And, and so to answer the first question, I, I would actually encourage folks to check out Decriminalize Nature. And so uh, for the individual who asked and for anyone who's listening, go to decriminalizenature.org. Um, I really see Decrim Nature as, as really leading the way nationally in terms of, of galvanizing and mobilizing and inspiring this, the nationwide grassroots movement. And they've made all of their um, procedures and, and uh, kind of templates available for free to anybody who wants to, um, to access them. Um, and then the second part of that question, to answer the second question, yes, right now it is just the city and county of Denver, the city limits. Um, now we do have a very active group in Boulder, Colorado, um, uh, Boulder County rather, who is looking at, uh, who are looking at potentially decriminalizing um, uh, and theogens in the in Boulder County, and then um, uh, something else here to consider too is that folks and what we're considering is also reaching out to our local sheriffs and other surrounding counties, um, along with other local um, uh, DAs and and law enforcement in surrounding counties of Denver. And really, you know, right now there isn't a plan to um, change per se. Um, what's I mean, there's definitely an idea to make this more accessible statewide. Um, I can't speak towards whether or not there will for sure be a ballot initiative statewide. Um, say in 2022, there may be, and the data suggests that uh, we very well could, um, but other groups are definitely actively working throughout the state and other counties to decriminalize as well. Mm -hmm. the, another question that just came in is, focused on, you know, uh, we've gotten to the point where we have a, a little bit of a, um, you know, a little bit of progress on, on decriminalization. So we've, we've kind of pushed the bar a little bit. So what happens next? Is it, you know, decriminalization in more places? Also, you know, myself kind of extending on that question, is there a pace that should we, we be going at? Should we be going as fast as possible? Or, you know, what are things that we could speed into too quickly? And what are things that we should be holding back on? And where are places that we can go, you know, full press on the gas pedal? Yeah, great, great, great question. So I, <laughs> one thing I've noticed is that this movement for sure has a mind of its own um, because it's, it's, again, it's moved so quickly just in the last year. And of course, I think that it's been able to move so quickly um, because of the, you know, two decades of, of clinical research that's been done to demonstrate the efficacy and the safety of psychedelics like psilocybin. Um, I can't really speak towards whether folks should slow down or not. That's not really my call. Um, and, and honestly, you know, I think what's most important here is that uh, folks really consider decriminalization first. Um, we want to ensure that regardless of any kind of a regulated model, um, that folks who choose not to, you know, walk into a treatment center have the opportunity to cultivate psilocybin for themselves to use it for personal use and then you know i think that really what we're seeing here is that in terms of decrim versus regulation um in my opinion this really is a it's, it's a both end movement so people are going to want to um folks may not want to go see a doctor um to receive 
um, you know, a synthetic version of psilocybin under, um, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a structured therapeutic environment in that sense, they, may, they, they might want to go um, grow their own mushrooms and go for a hike in the park or work with uh, an experienced sitter or guide in the comfort of their own home, right? So uh, I think a lot of these right now are all experiments. Um, Denver was certainly an experiment. Oregon's an experiment. DC's an experiment. And we're going to see more experiments pop, popping up um, over the course of the next two to five years. And um, again, from my perspective, uh, decriminalization is absolutely the priority because this is a, it's a people's movement. Mm -hmm, definitely. Well, one of the things that you mentioned during your talk was asking people about their experience with psilocybin, for instance, um, to gauge, you know, uh, trust or relationship, et cetera. Uh, there's so many different startups uh, popping up in this ecosystem right now. And I think that there's, you know, all these questions around trust. Who do you collaborate with? Who do you step aside from? Who's in it for the right reasons and the wrong reasons? What are some ways that you've, uh, you know, for yourself decided to be able to determine whether you do or do not want to work with a specific for-profit venture in this space? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. That's another great question. Um, you know, it's a really good question. I think for me personally, what it comes down to is that conversation and that communication, right? And if, and, you know, one, of course, if somebody does have, um, you know, personal experience, even if it's just one time, for example, using mushrooms and, and it's transformed their life, that's awesome. And then there's so much more about, um, um, you know, what is the person committed to? Are they, if an organization is, is you know, focused on this solely for profit, um, you know, I'm not sure I would consider uh, um, personally working with that person. Um, again, it's a case by case basis, you know, and, and for me, it's really important to hear when speaking with folks, especially if we're talking about for profit, which, you know, of course, there are a lot of those emerging now, you know, just really what's, what's the intention of that individual? There's nothing wrong with, I, I believe nothing wrong with, with, with making a profit in this space. Um, but how, you know, if there is a profit, you know, really what is that, that core ethos or that bottom line, how are those profits being used to, to further access and to uh, just really uplift, you know, individuals in our communities, because that's what this is all about. Mm -hmm, definitely. Well, Kevin, thank you so much for sharing. Thank you for your insights and time. We really appreciate it. It's a pleasure being here. Thank you. <laughs> Be well. Take care.